Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm your host, Deacon Jonathan Stewart, and I'm joined by all of your favorite people, all repeating guests and repeating co-hosts. Uh, and we're talking about the Gospel of John and Gnosticism and mysticism in sort of a relaxed panel, chill way. We're just going to share our personal gnosis about this important text with you all. So we've got Jason Memo, of course. Hello, Jason. Hello. We've got returning to the show, Deacon Angie. Hello, Deacon. Hello. We've got uh, re returning to the show, Nick Lachetti. Hello, Nick. Hey. <laughs> Nick, thanks so much for coming. He's uh, 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 he, he's out he, he's out personed by Yoanites <laughs> in this show, but at least we have one slightly different perspective. Of course, <laughs> actually, all Yoanites, when you get them into the same room, we'll all have different perspectives, and we'll probably start arguing, which we will talk about, actually, probably with the Gospel of John, <laughs> a text about Yoanites arguing with each other. Uh, before we get to the gospel of john uh we got to do our commercials uh jason i, I forgot we, we got to start doing new bits uh we're both theater artists we're going to write a a, a free act play about subscribing to our patreon and perform it to you at the beginning of every show uh first little this idea. dollar for piece of media you can help us create the show we can't do it about your financial support you can donate more than that you can also set a limit uh, uh depending on your budget or if you're worried that we're going to do a million pieces of media and make a million dollars off of you that month you can also do one-time donations at paypal.com slash gnostic and if you can't help us out financially or if you can something else that's really important and helps us out a lot is playing the digital archons game so like and subscribe <laughs> and share the show and bring it out into the real world get it away from the digital archons tell people about the show if you like it you send them your favorite episode uh mouth the year is still incredibly powerful in this world Okay, so the Gospel of John, pretty important book, pretty important book to Yoanites, pretty important book to uh, Christian mystics. So I, I have sort of um, uh, a really chill, relaxed uh, topic sheet. Uh, my first question for us all is, did you have a relationship with the Gospel of John before diving more into mysticism and Gnosticism? So uh, Angie, take it away. Um, you know, I did. I, I wouldn't describe myself as a super scriptural person. I know a lot of Gnostics tend to rely really heavily on on reading Olympics, and I, I definitely do a lot of reading, but I don't think I compete at that level. Um, but the Gospel of John, there would be certain experiences I had had um, earlier in my meditative practice, and I would find myself leaning on that particular book. None of the other Gospels really spoke to me, none of the other books of the New Testament did, but the, the introduction to Gospel of John was something that I spent a lot of time contemplating and really enjoyed. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jason, just because you, 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 don't, you don't groove with the Jesus stuff as much as uh, <laughs> you're not, you're not, you're not a big JC guy. <laughs> you know, relationship or non-relationship with this book before uh, becoming a Yoanite. You know, it's not it's not even so much that I don't jive with the Jesus guy. It's more like I think the 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 sort of aggregate abundance of detail that Christianity has has built over 2000 years has less mojo for me, like uh, just in general, like it's not how I connect to 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 a lot of things. So um, or at least it's not the fastest way for me to connect, whereas I actually am super interested in the stuff the big JC says. Uh, if that makes sense, I find that stuff really interesting, and so I think the Gospel of John is great for that. I didn't really have a relationship with the text. Actually, I think reading reading the Gospel of John for this show is probably the first time I've read an entire book of the Bible, like ever. <laughs> Every up to that point, I'd read bits, you know, quotes to try to maybe get some context. And I've always loved the like in the beginning was the word. I think that was always that's always been a very poetic, beautiful mm -hmm. element to me, but. Um, so yeah, so my my relationship is uh, pretty new <laughs> as of today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well there we go. People are getting some really fresh content then. Exactly. So, uh, uh, Nick. Oh yeah. Well, so yeah, the interesting thing with me with that is I I really wasn't raised Christian, so I got into occult stuff as a teenager. So I I didn't get into the Gospel of John prior to doing kind of occultism and reading a little bit about Gnosticism and things like that. But then I did kind of in college, I think I've maybe talked about this in various other things uh, other at this point, but I kind of cycled back into a more orthodox study of Christianity. So 
I kind of went back, I kind of went backwards into the more traditional reading. But then similar to what, what Deacon Angie's saying, I feel like there's probably going to be a pattern where the Gospel of John definitely was the gospel I liked the most. I think people who are kind of esoterically inclined probably tend to feel that way. And yeah, and the, the prologue was also really powerful to me. So um, so yeah, so I feel like it had a pretty big impact on me studying early Christianity and patristic Christianity. And then, you know, studying it again in seminary um, and then go, in a mainline seminary and then kind of coming back to it through occult and esoteric stuff. So kind of went back and forth. For this for this conversation, I actually pulled up my uh, New Testament class final workbook project, which was where we had to read every book in the New Testament and outline everything. And it's I remember doing it, it was like a nightmare. It's like 40 pages, but so, you know, that's like the super mainstream view of it in scholarship, so yeah. Yeah. Um, for myself, uh, you know, I was kind of a, I, I was a really religious kid. My family wasn't religious and I used to really like, uh, read the Bible, although religious in a really liberal way because I was part of an extremely liberal church, but yeah, I was a weird, weird, lonely kid. So, uh, I, I didn't <laughs> I always really company. like the gospel of John, but <laughs> yeah. it's a close second for me, maybe even now, or maybe it's tied if you're going to look at canonical, uh, books, period, canonical gospels, but Mark really gets me and everybody, I'm going to do a show on Mark, reread Mark. That book is weird. It's deep. Deeply, mm. deeply, deeply weird. And of course, I love the the ending, which we'll talk about in Mark. But John, John was a close second. Obviously, the prologue uh, uh, always spoke to me. You know, the, the sort of mystical union stuff that you can discover within the Gospel of John, which I don't think is a read-in, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And of course, all the writings about love. Right. You know, all, all of that did appeal to me from from a very young age. So I do feel like I had a special relationship with the Gospel of John. And I still feel like I do it and Mark. Um, you know, I really like uh, Luke's social justice uh, focus and uh, Matthew has the Beatitudes. So um, but uh, as far as literary, some of their other qualities, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of, of the other two. Um, <laughs> uh, Mark, Mark and John is, is, is where it's it's ash uh, uh, for me. Um, what do you guys, what do you folks find exciting in the Gospel of John in your own spiritual life? You know, I'll, I'll pick on Jason because maybe the answer is going to be uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, well, like I've, I have loved that prologue for a really long time. Um, like I think there's, uh, uh, it's like um, uh, ancient postmodernism, you know, uh, this like, this understanding that the map is not the territory, and that like how we describe the world has so much to do with the world we're we're trying to live in. Like, there's so much to unpack in that. So in that respect, I would say it has been a big part of uh, of the interlocking pieces of my spiritual life for quite a while. Um, but that's really just the prologue. <laughs> um, I think the uh, uh, one thing that I have found more recently that um, a call out actually to uh, one of my other favorite podcasts, the Secret History of Western Esotericism podcast, or Schwepp, um, has had a lot of episodes on on apophatic uh, religions or apophatic approaches to religion, which is to say, like uh, a focus on the unsayable, the unknowable. Like, and how do you even get to talking about that stuff? And I feel like, I mean, I, I've just outed myself as having only read one book and it's this one in the Bible, but like, <laughs> it feels like this might be the only book that is of the four that is in, inherently apophatic. That is like, that not just the prologue, but so many other of his quotes are um, are him saying like, I am not this or this, or you, you say I am this, but I'm actually this. And, the, and like things that are, uh, incompatible so it creates like almost like thunder perfect mind it has this moment of like like you're trying to hold two thoughts in your two two opposite thoughts in your head at once um so those are things i i have found exciting and i found them exciting again when i when i encountered it uh, reading it last night <laughs> yeah i um a lot of people think that there there might be a relationship between thunder and the gospel of john right because of the i ams uh, mm -hmm. And because of some of the the gender stuff that that is in Gospel of John, which we can which which we can get to, uh, and I did notice that there's there's uh, the scene closer to the end. Uh, of course, both John and Mark are famous for kind of being really centered around the crucifixion. Everything's just sort of you know getting to the passion, right? And mm -hmm. you, you know, the Gospel of John is is just a lot of Jesus talking, and then the passion, which is more of him talking. <laughs> um, but you know, at, at some point we're in the middle. I, I it, even though I reread it you know, today or yesterday, I already can't remember. But there's uh, there's a scene where he's speaking, and and God speaks from heaven, backing him up. And then yeah. people in the crowd say, "I heard thunder." Hmm. 
Also, mm. John, the, the disciple John, was known as the Son of Thunder. Um, strangely, oh. I, I, can't, I can't remember if he's called Son of Thunder in Gospel of John. That might be in, in Mark or Luke or Matthew. So. Yeah. Um, but uh, 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 Deacon Angie, uh, uh, how about you? What do you find exciting with the Gospel of John in your own spiritual life? Um, I think I'm going to piggyback on what Jason was saying about how um, there's the the two polarities working with one another. Um, I, as a parent, I study attachment parenting to to relate to my children, and they talk about for people their road to maturity is being able to hold two experiences at one time, and that maturity has less to do with physical age and more to do with that ability. And so you can have a full grown person that hasn't moved into maturity. And I also think about um, Bernadette Roberts who talked, so Bernadette Roberts talks about how the Christ um, is separate from an individual. It's a part of humanity. And for her, it's um, another step of human maturation. Um, and so that when I think about that combination of human maturation, being able to hold polarities, and then also on a spiritual level, Bernadette talking about um, human maturation being that both human and separate from humanity, both human and divine polarity within herself. I just think that's a really neat combination of of um, looking at the the book of John as, as a, a proclamation as opposed to a specific thing that we're supposed to do where where like the beatitudes like in matthew this is a very specific thing you're supposed to do yeah. where the book of john it's a proclamation of what is to come does that am i tracking oh totally and you know there's not a lot of morals and ethics and uh any of that in the gospel of john right there's just a lot mm -hmm. of jesus you know talking about himself and talking about love um and you know, I really like that, uh, what you said about the Christ, because it seems that the earliest Christology and what seems to be the Gospel of John's Christology, its original Christology, is, is adoptionism, which is mm -hmm. the, the Christ came down like a dove upon Jesus. Mm -hmm. So in, in my own personal Christology, he first became worthy to receive the Christ, right? He had to do spiritual work in, it was sort of an enlightenment experience. And we can read this into John, as I said, I think it is the, the original interpretation of how they understood uh, the Christ in John. We have about one sentence where Jesus is not the Christ, right? Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, him, uh, there's a prologue and then uh, John, John meets Jesus. And then Jesus said, I saw the spirit like a dove come down upon him and stay with him, right? I'm paraphrasing. From there on, after that one sentence, he is the Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I, I, just I find wanna... that to be, in many ways, a very, a very Gnostic idea. And it seems to be the Christology of mm -hmm. not just Gnostic Christians, but many early Christians and many, many early Gnostics. Uh, uh, Nick, the uh, the Gospel of John and, and what you find exciting in your own spiritual life, if anything yeah, at all. Yeah. Angie, did you have something you wanted to say? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I just want to just want to cover for anybody that else has that has read Bernadette. She wouldn't describe herself as an adoptionist. It mm -hmm. she describes Jesus as being um incarnated with it, but that while Jesus was incarnated with it, and in, not in a reincarnation way, but in a you know, coming into the earth sort of way, um that we're all supposed to get there. So I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't calling her an adoptionist. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> in yeah. case There's she not came many left out there. So. From the grave and uh, <laughs> yeah. smoke in my face or something. Anyway. Um, but yeah, no, I think one of the things that I have written down in my little note workbook about this is the, this, the from verses or chapters two to 12 as the book of signs, um, which I think scholars use as, as, you know, that section, which may have been based on an earlier source, but just this interesting thing where the gospel is really, like Angie is saying, it's not a lot of like moral stuff, but it's more of just Jesus showing who he is through these signs. And I think that that's, I, I think that's probably one of the reasons I always liked it the most is because of that. But then the other reason for me is, is just Jesus is sometimes people will criticize it and say that Jesus is, is, is very aloof in this gospel and more kind of almost like a Buddha, like a little bit like an alien <laughs> to, to the rest of the people and kind of speaking in this kind of very strange mystical way. So it actually is is usually, I mean, this is a, a kind of a generalization, but it's not the most popular gospel in like the liberal Christian context that I've been in a lot in seminary. Um, and yet the interesting thing about that is it also has that moment where, which I think is not the shortest verse in Greek, but is the shortest verse in English where Jesus wept because his friend's dead. 
and that's so human too so it has this kind of superhuman moment where but then it's also jesus as this mystical kind of being um so i feel like holding those things together is is always been interesting to me i mean that's kind of one of the most that story of, of raising lazarus to me is one of the more powerful stories as well yeah yeah i, I always find that that's that's a cartoon or an opinion about the gospel of john that, mm. that i never really vibed with and again moving in liberal christian circles i have noticed that bias against it right but i you know i i don't i don't see that as much now i do agree obviously if if Jason, when you read the other Gospels, you're going to notice, like, this, this is a different Jesus in many ways. Um, and, you know, I, I can't argue with that. That is obvious. And, and of course, the sort of, the idea of, of the alien Christ, you know, he often does talk about himself not belonging to this world. But at the same time, you know, I, I, I agree with Nick, you know, like, all, all the talking, again, I'm going to come back to all the talk about love, right? Mm -hmm. Him washing the, the disciples' feet. Uh, I just said beats. The, um, uh, the, the sometimes being kind of short tempered with his mother, mm. like you know, there's I, I find this uh, this human element is is there. Um, now for my own personal spiritual life, um, with my sort of again the prologue, uh, it has always been very moving for me. You know, I pray it, I meditate upon it, I use it right liturgically, um, and the. The, what I think is the qualified non-dualism uh, of the Gospel of John, of everybody being united, um, but uh, through Christ and then therefore through through the Father, right? It's very very important important for me, and also in, in my spiritual life, you know, I have really become uh, I. I've gone everywhere from dualist to non-dualist, and lately qualified non-dualist, which will, which will, mm. which we we can talk about, which I really kind of find in this in this gospel. And of course, for my spiritual life, when I'm relating to to other Christians, when uh, I'm looking for points of agreement, uh, when I'm making arguments about Gnosticism and its importance, you know, I really see the Gospel of John as as a Gnostic text. So that that mm. becomes very important for me, right? Because it's it, it's it's a, a point we can all groove on. I um sort of had a, I had a very pleasant positive experience a year ago two years ago a year and a half ago um that that was that was also kind of weird which was I was invited to speak to a um uh, an evangelical church uh and they, they did a very interesting um speaker series where they had somebody from a different faith come in every month and they kind of it turned out they had accidentally booked me they thought i was a buddhist for some reason maybe because of my meditation work. Um, <laughs> oh, but we we figured it out and i and i still came in and you know i, I discovered you know lots of uh lots of, of, of points of comparison, lots of common ground that, that we could talk about, right? Uh, and a lot of that did trace back to the Gospel of John, which, um, which, Nick, you, you, which often seems to be bigger in evangelical circles <laughs> um, or in perhaps non-liberal non Christian circles. Yeah, I mean, I had a question about that. I, so I also see it as really uh, powerful and kind of important in, in Eastern Orthodox circles, um, yeah. which I feel like sort of relates to some of the, the reason, same reason why it would be popular in Gnostic circles, but I wonder about this interplay of darkness and light in the gospel, because I John you used the phrase dualism or non-dualism or qualified non-dualism. And so I feel like there's a lot there that I mean, first of all, that reminds me of like Manichaeanism and all these other traditions that talk about darkness and light, but um because I feel like you could see it as dualistic, but then it's not right. And usually that seems to be the case whenever anyone says something's dualistic. But where the Manichaeans are maybe the best examples we have of a Western dualistic faith, but mm -hmm. uh, you know I do say I see them as cousins to the to the Gnostics, but not not properly not properly Gnostics. But uh, you know that that leads quite well to my next question, and, and maybe you want to talk on this first, Nick. Do you consider it a Gnostic text? And I made sure in the notes to give that a capital G. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. That's such a like a confusing question. I don't know. Yeah, it. I think that it is. It feels like it, it's like required almost for Gnostic and esoteric readings of Christianity. I feel like it's like the basis of those. So in that way, yeah. But then, like I was saying, it's also seen as as this really important text for Eastern Orthodox Christian. I mean, it's in, it's in every form of Christianity, really. But you know, Eastern Orthodoxy sees um, kind of it, the basis of of some of the doctrines of theosis and other things. I feel like come out really strong in this text. I mean, for me, um, when I was kind of much more of a practicing Roman Catholic, the the kind of the very vampiric part <laughs> later on where Jesus says you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood and all of that and they're like that's weird I don't want to do that and he's like no you have to 
And then, so that becomes a really, there's a lot of bases for kind of Catholic devotion in this too, um, or the sec, the wedding of Cana and the way that Jesus and, and Mary interact, even though Jesus is kind of short with her. Um, just as a, so I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure I would see it as, as a Gnostic in a way that undermines more Orthodox readings or Orthodox in a way that undermines Gnostic. It just seems to have a, the ability to go in a lot of directions for anyone mystically inclined. Yeah. Uh, is it Deacon Angie? Uh, yeah. I mean, when I was going through it this morning, um, I would definitely label it as a Gnostic text. I think it inspires Gnosis in people, which I think is also another hallmark of, is it Gnostic or not? Um, and then also, you know, Jesus says, my teaching is not of me, but is of him who sent me. Um, you know, he talks about how it's not his personal knowledge and that it's it sort of you know, one of those texts that it's, it's not, you know, I, I know that Jesus sort of separates himself from most teachers of that. He didn't learn it from somebody else. It came from within him, but I think that's super highlighted in the gospel of John. And so I, I do think it's more Gnostic E than, than a genealogy. Let's just put it that way. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Jason. Well, I mean, you've probably heard me say say this before on the show, but uh, I think like for me, the idea of reading something as Gnostic is like always an implicit yes or maybe. Um, uh, but that's that's anything, not even not just this gospel. I think the the, the vibe I get, the the vibe I really got when reading it, was that it was half a Gnostic text and half a text that was trying to legitimize itself so that the non Gnostics would let it in. Yeah. You know, um, because like half of it is like, here's these apophatic statements. And then the other half is like, and see, he did this thing that's that's like lines up with these other prophecies. And see, he did this other thing that lines up with this other like, um, you know, uh, bit of logic around how things are supposed to go. And so, yeah, like it, it felt like um, it felt like a text designed to be included, if that makes sense, yeah. uh, or designed to be like uh, low key subversive, like this will get past the censors. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I, th I consider it Gnostic, especially in that sense of the idea the, of um, finding a connection that that is not like one of the big things about Gnosticism that I think is interesting is that it's not something that can be taught to you. It's something that can be experienced. So I think it's interesting. We have a text that is trying to kind of allow you to have an experience that you can't have with a text. If that makes sense. Again, it goes back to that apophatic um, uh, holding an impossibility experience. Yeah. Um, I think you, and of course, uh, I can't say biblical studies because it is a vast field with, with a lot of disagreement. <laughs> now, there's definitely some, some mainstream opinions, and then there's some opinions that are research and backed up with some solid work that may not be as mainstream, right? But uh, Jason, you, you sort of intuitively grasped without knowing any of the scholarship, some of the theories about the Gospel of John. Uh, and I'm probably, the, the people watching probably know who I'm going to bring up, but St. April DeConnick. Basically, <laughs> her thesis is exactly what you said, Jason. The, the Gospel of John famously, and, and people have noticed this for a long time, even before modern secular religious studies and uh, New Testament biblical studies, which is the Gospel of John seems to have gone through a few edits and we can see the scenes, right? Like the, the second ending, the, there might even be three endings that were tacked on. Uh, like the Gospel of John seems to end and then all of a sudden you have this sequence of Peter um, and like there's an ending and then it restarts, you know. Um, the, the there, There's a lot of editorial notes, which in the translation that, that I read for this show actually puts them in brackets. And when, when they're in brackets, it becomes about a thousand times more annoying, where you're constantly commenting on uh, uh, the Judean customs and explaining this and explaining that, and you don't really need it. Um, and some of the sequences, you know, Jesus sometimes does a little bit of transporting around. <laughs> um, he's suddenly zipping around all these different locations. So people have noticed for, for, for a long time that that, that we can see the themes. Um, as uh, Nick mentioned, one of the theories is an early source of the Gospel of John, which is something called the Book of Signs, which is seven miracles that Jesus did, seven symbolic miracles that, that, that proved he was who he said he was. And they probably were linked to the seven days of creation uh, in Genesis. We can also talk about the book's relationship with Genesis. You know, that, that's one source, but it seems to go through kind of three edits. So to make a long story short, at least, and I, I think scholars uh, on the whole are, are kind of accepting this and have known this for a while, but 
the other hard thing about talking about these texts and the origins of these texts is that they all seem like all the Gospels and a lot of the books in the New Testament seem to really be in flux in the early years of Christianity. And then different communities uh, within Christianity, because Christianity was quite diverse, would kind of come along and do their own edits and use it in their own way. So, it, it, you know, you don't really want to think about the Gospel of John being the solid you know, set in stone text in the first couple of Christian centuries. Uh, even, in, you know, we have this version that has all these edits, but there might have been all sorts of edits by all sorts of different groups. Anyways, to make a yeah. long story short, April DeConnick believes that, you know, the earliest version of the Gospel of John is a Gnostic text, a proto-Gnostic text, if you if you want to say proto, that has a, a theology that uh, where Gnosis is, is saving and that that has a theology about the Demiurge running this world, uh, that has uh, a theology and a cosmology that is is quite similar to a, what a lot of people think about in the Gnostic myth. And what she uses to prove that is, you know, all the talk about the ruler of this world, um, mm -hmm. the adversary. You know, the Gospel of John makes it quite clear that 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 this is a fallen world not ruled by God, right? Which is which can be very Gnostic. But her, the, one of the thrusts of her arguments is, is we have the heresiologists, we have early readings of um, Jesus is arguing with the, the Judeans. Uh, and uh, in most translations and all modern translations, it says something like, uh, you know, you're liars because you are from your father, the devil, who, who is the father of all lies, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I, I'm mangling it, but it's something like that. The original Greek seems to be, you are from the father of the devil, the father of lies. Okay, well, who's the father of the devil? It seems, and this works really, really well. I, I think you folks are really going to like this. It, it seems that the original theology of the Gospel of John is you have the fake God, the Demiurge, and his son, the devil. The devil's the one running the world on behalf of the fake God. And you know how much duality there is in the Gospel of John and how much it loves comparing light and darkness and uh, falseness and truth. Well, this really sets up a really amazing uh, symbolic parallel because now you have the fake God and the fake son. You have the real God and the real son, who's the rightful ruler of the world. So it does, uh, and we also have... Um, one of the earliest commentaries on any biblical book, which I tried to put in the notes, uh, I was a little bit ill yesterday and not in my right mind. I'm also not that smart, but I, I wrote in Heraclitus, who was an ancient Greek philosopher, and Deacon Angie was reading Heraclitus this morning, trying to figure out what it had to do with the Gospel of John. <laughs> I met with Heraclian, who was uh, a Gnostic, who wrote uh, uh, a commentary on the Gospel of John. And he does have some stuff in there that seems spot on, but of course, anything can, can mean anything, right? So so, for instance, so Heraclian writes, uh, when then Jesus uh, went down to Caperta, right? And according to Heraclian, well, this is symbolic of Jesus descending from the Pleroma into the Canoma. And I'm like, well, did, did the original writers really mean that? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> but it does seem that perhaps the original, one of the original authors of one of the versions of the Gospel of John was, was a Gnostic. Jason. We're, what you're picking up is that um, uh, both... Um, uh, um, April DeConnick and other scholars think that these edits were to make it still mystical, but to make it less capital G Gnostic, to make it a broader text that could appeal to the proto-Orthodox church. So, uh, you know, and I really like those series, but you do get some interesting, it's not Heraclean, but there's, a, there's another early commentary on John where the prologue, uh, Nick, if you look at the Greek for the prologue, right? Not sure. You have stuff <laughs> like life, Zoe, uh, you have light, uh, you have the church, I think. I'm trying to remember what else is in, in the opening. So some of the early Gnostics were the, the, the words, these Greek words are actually the names of, of the aeons in, mm -hmm. um, in uh, uh, certain forms of Valentinianism. So they're saying, oh, what the prologue is actually saying, it's secretly the creation of the universe through the aeons spilling mm -hmm. out from, from the divine. And I thought that was really neat because the names do sort of sync up. However, did they perhaps they might have gotten the names from that opening, right? Yeah, that, I mean, for me, that's the thing that's confusing. I questions like, is something Gnostic or Orthodox? Just because I don't know. I think if you asked, is it Orthodox? I'd also be like, I don't know, because it's sort of in the, the the kind of the mix of early Christianity, all these concepts were, I mean, you know, floating around in a lot of ways without kind of traditions being so demarcated. I think. So yes. I, I feel like that's one of the questions that I have about about something like that. I mean, yeah, the the first chapter definitely hit, remind, I was reading today it reminds me of the Silmarillion, like Tolkien, which is <laughs> a very like, but you know, 
in this kind of pr like primeval the way the world came to be and it's kind of abstract and there's a lot of like light and all that kind of stuff but yeah i don't know it's interesting because then other passages you, you know when you read like the one that's like eat my flesh and drink my blood when the when you know in the text when people are like we don't want that's what does that mean and then jesus is like this you know the, the the flesh doesn't profit you i think he says the spirit it's actually the spirit that prophets you. So like kind of you're reading it wrong if you think, you know, it's literal. But then, of course, it's taken as like the basis of a lot of Eucharistic theology and kind of more Catholic and Orthodox tradition. So there's a lot of things there that that's, I don't know. Yeah, it, it's taken a lot of different ways. Yeah. Well, I, I really think that is the best way to think about it. And perhaps many ancient texts, right? Because, you know, that demarcation between Gnosticism and Orthodoxy probably did happen later, but that not when the texts were uh, created, right? And I think that's important to remember, though, that we're kind of swimming in this very interesting uh, uh, early Christian stew with groups and peoples and philosophers and writers and people having mystical experiences that really don't have the same categories as, as we do uh, in the ways of thinking about the world. Um, and uh, and Nick, I know you know we need somebody on here, so so we're not huffing our own fumes, right? But, but you know, I, I think I have heard his his evidence, uh, Marionis, uh, the, the patriarch of the, the Joannite Church, say that um, you know uh, informally, so this is not a statement of the church, but you know the, the AJC is is in some ways looking back to to those early Joannite communities, early Joannite communities that weren't quite Gnostic and were quite Orthodox, and were sort of in the middle. Right. And trying to recreate that for the modern age, because, you know, the, there are people within because we don't we were not having on doctrine or there are people within the church that have um, uh, probably more mystical, more orthodox views. Of course, our, you know, our liturgy and the, the way that we look uh, uh, seems very orthodox to people. But I find that very interesting. I find that yeah. uh, a great way to, to have one's cake and eat it, too. That way, I mean, that's one thing you can see in the text, I think, that is demarcated is, is like the communities that we're creating. So obviously John, who I don't think is named John, right? It's just the beloved disciple, but right. is clearly this figure that is closer to Jesus than, the, than Peter, especially. And then, you know, and I think Mary Magdalene, this is the gospel of Mary Magdalene, actually f like encounters the risen Christ first, yes. um, in the, at least in this version. And then, you know, Jesus like, don't touch me. The whole thing, that is an interesting part where because he hasn't risen yet so you can see the communities that trace themselves to those specific disciples really clearly in the text it's you know not compatible with the other ones i don't think really no and it can be really fun and uh we'll get to this uh in a moment sorry i keep promising so much for the back end of the show but it's really fun to read the gospel of john and maybe end at the at the crucifixion and then pick up the gospel of mary or the secret book of john and read those as the resurrections mm. Because I think you know it's it's quite possible my own my own pet you know it's actually Father Tony's pet theory that you know perhaps that these texts were deliberately meant to go with the Gospel of John as post resurrection uh, appearances uh, and it makes a lot of sense and it's a lot of fun um, the other the other theory I really like too is that so as so I mentioned you know we, we, this is an unstable text went through a lot of edits that the identity of the beloved disciple uh, changes depending on who the editor is. Uh, so perhaps in one edit, it's John, uh, perhaps in another edit, it's Lazarus, which is a popular theory, right? Uh, in another edit, uh, maybe the earliest source is the beloved disciple is Mary, right? Which is a, a common a common theory, uh, beloved of uh, many uh, uh, occultists and mystics and es esotericists. And uh, I didn't send it to you folks. There is, um, I, I believe uh, Bishop Tim talked about it uh, on a uh, AJC conclave talk I'll, uh, that should be up on YouTube. So I'll, I'll find it and link it in the notes. But th there is another version of the Gospel of John uh, that is that is said to be ancient um, and go back to uh, a Marian group that brought it from the Middle East to France. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, they have released a copy of it, but we can't see the original Greek because it's a secret internal text. So, you know, we're getting a little dodgy here. But to make a long story short, it's it's a version of the Gospel of John where uh, that's very focused on Mary, where Mary is the beloved disciple. So is it a modern text? Mm -hmm. Is it an ancient text? I don't know, but it's interesting. So um, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, okay. So I guess I can broaden this out to sort of a cult, right? But we, we were going to have a, a, a Mason or another Mason on the show. But for the Masons and the Martinists here, what's up with the Gospel of John and that tradition? And I can broaden that out to non stuff that isn't a Christian church. <laughs> you know, people using it who are who are in traditions and stuff like Martinism, stuff like Masonry, stuff like 
um, uh, uh, any of those other esoteric orders might be using Gospel of John. And actually, do you mind if I start with you again, Nick? Because you know, I know you have a, sort of a, a strong background and uh, are a part of uh, many movements. So, um, <laughs> sure. And no, so I, I guess. Well, the main thing that I just think of when you mention that is just John one one. You know, it becomes this kind of basic text to open a lot of different types of you know kind of esoteric Masonic lodges, and so. Um, you know, in traditions that I've been part of, that's usually the, that the Bible is open to that, you know, the, the, the dagger or whatever is, or sword is placed on that. That's the, how the lodge is open. So, um, so it's always been kind of taught that you're kind of connecting, you know, the opening of the lodge to this, this text about the shaping of the material cosmos by, by the logo. So that, that to me is like what stands out the most. I mean, that, that, and, you know, besides the, the stuff that we're kind of really talking about, which is that so many kind of esoteric movements have traced themselves to like a Johannite community or through some lineage that connects to, to that. So I don't know. Yeah. Maybe that's, that's, that's it for me at the moment. Yeah. I think it, Andrew. Um, I don't have a ton of experience in these other orders. Uh, I have a spouse that's a Mason. Um, but again, I'm not particularly invited to those circles. <laughs> uh, Jason, anything for you? Uh, I mean, I feel like maybe you have a direction you want the answer to go in, <laughs> um, but I don't know if I can give that to you either because I'm uh, I'm uh, uh, bad at homework. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, I think like the, the my experience with uh, with esoteric orders uh, is often a lot more like current based. What what are we working on right now? And so I have a harder time holding some of the longer. The, the the deeper elements of uh, where the tradition comes from in my head, frankly. Um, uh, so, yeah, don't tell anyone. Okay, <laughs> Except I for won't. the fact that this is on a show. <laughs> your, the secret, your secrets about secret esoteric orders will stay secret. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> your secrets yeah. about their oh, homework. Oh, I'm just being really secret right now. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> I'm totally um, not. I, uh, oh, geez, I, I have a rant to get to before I actually answer this question because the Nick reminded me, because we talk about the prologue so much, but if you read the prologue, then, then all of a sudden you're like, okay, well, Jesus is the Logos, but it, what about this April Deconic theory about the Demiurge, the Demiurge creating the world, ruling this world? Doesn't the text itself talk about that? You know, there is a dark ruler of this world, yet it was created for the Logos. And and Heraclean actually writes about this in his commentary, where, where he talks about, well, you know, what the prologue is talking about is creation itself, right? The pre-creation um, of the perfect pleroma that this is a bad copy of. And then he also writes, there's an idea in some Gnostic circles um, that the... Uh, that the logos was kind of whispering in the ear of the demiurge, uh, so that the demiurge, uh, without the demiurge realizing it, the demiurge thinking that, oh, I've got this great idea, but it was actually the logos being like, hey, hey try to make it like this. That'd be really cool, right? <laughs> doing the logos doing its best to make a universe that wasn't utter shit, but because the demiurge is lesser, that he can only it can only create lesser. Um, oh yeah, so, so esoteric uh, cults. Um, what have you. Um, actually, even the Gnostics of the 1800s, just all sorts of mystics, occultists, and Gnostics, and gnostic -y groups throughout the last 2,000 years, not only the ancient Gnostics, saw all these themes in the Gospel of John and used it, right? So famously, the um, uh, Cathars, right? They, they said the Gospel of John was, was the only legitimate gospel in the Bible, I think, and they used it a lot. You know, they're around 1100, 1200, so about a thousand years later than the ancient Gnostics. Um, you have lots of, of medieval mystics um, who were Orthodox Christians, but who really work with the Gospel of John. And, um, you know, we didn't have a lot of Gnostic texts until the 1940s. So the, uh, both uh, the, the French Church of John, which was a mystical uh, 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 Joannite church, which maybe would not be Gnostic in, in ways that we would, uh, capital G Gnostic, maybe small G Gnostic. They use the Gospel of John a lot, and of course the Joannite, the AJC, is partly um, descended from them. And then there's the Gnostics of the 1890s, and they, they released basically a statement saying that, you know, the only, the only Gnostic Gospel is the Gospel of John, and they used it a lot. But, but Nick said something yeah. interesting. There's, there's an idea, um, which is probably mythological, of course, uh, but I, I think is, um, you know, the myths, myths are ways of communicating truths that are, that are deeper than reality or, or history, that, that the community that created the Gospel of John went underground, uh, did not, you know, 
join up with orthodoxy, be persecuted, you know, uh, went underground, was able to stay cohesively Gnostic and mystical and uh, led to a whole bunch of movements over the last 2000 years, right? Um, including uh, the, the Templars, including the groups that the AJC traces uh, some of its lineages back to, including esoteric orders, uh, some forms of masonry, what have you. So, you know, it may not be literally true, but I, I, I kind of think it's a, a cool idea. You know, I, I always like this idea of, of the secret Church of John. And some people have used it in a symbolic way, right? That no matter what's going on, like when Christianity is doing bad things, there's always the secret Church of John, the secret um, Church of Love that exists in, in the heart of, of every mystic and every Gnostic who has uh, experienced the divine and uh, loves and performs good acts. Yeah. So it may not be literally true, but it's always figuratively true that the Church of John mm -hmm. is always there in secret. I think that's in, in like Gustav Meyrink, who's a you know a pan Sophic kind of figure and novelist who wrote about the difference between the, the Church of John and the Church of Peter um, as a kind of a way of distinguishing this kind of inner church from this kind of hierarchical Roman church. Um, but then one thing I wanted to, I mean, John, maybe you're going to talk more about it, but I was also curious, I mean, both the kind of the lineage thing where a lot of esoteric groups trace themselves to, to, to a Johannite community, but then also um, that thinking about like John 1-1 one, one and, and kind of how, you know, the way that's used in certain lodges, I, I'm wondering about kind of the the relationship of like light and darkness in the gospel of john and then like martinism so you know i wondered if you had a whole martinist explanation of some of that uh no not really <laughs> but let me <laughs> think about that nick because i imagine we'll either come back to it in the show or or a future show mm -hmm. um uh, i'll table i'll table that question but of course martinism uh does use the gospel of john quite a bit yeah. um both both practically but i think drawing inspiration from it um but uh, I'll come back to that. But uh, we should talk about uh, the Leviticon. So the Leviticon is an alternate version of the Gospel of John. And it was discovered in the uh, late 1700s in some versions, the early 1800s in some versions of its, of its discovery, uh, and came into the hands of uh, Fabre Palaprat, who started a Joanite church uh, under Napoleon, um, and uh, believed it to be the original version of the Gospel of John. It is, it's shorter. Uh, it, uh, uh, we don't. We, we only have French copies of it. We don't have the original Greek that supposedly existed. So some people, many people, just believe that that Fabre Palaprat made it up. Uh, that said, if you read about it without reading it, uh, people say that 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 it portrays a very human Jesus. That uh, it has no miracles, and it says that uh, Jesus was a um, uh, a priest of Isis in Egypt. <laughs> um, none of that's in it. So the, I, I highly recommend that people just read the text for themselves. But, but what's quite interesting about it is, is a lot of the editorial stuff is one of the reasons it's shorter and has less de detail is a lot of the editorial stuff isn't there, which, which I find to be quite sophisticated if, you're, if, if it is uh, an 1800s or a 1700s text, because it, it looks to me like what an earlier version of the Gospel of John would look like. Um, because we don't have all these editorial notes and it's quite sophisticated to go through it and, and take it all out before we really have modern biblical studies. Um, the two, the three most shocking things about it is um, it doesn't, I, I believe it does have slightly less miracles. Uh, it doesn't have the editorial stuff, but the shocking things are that um, it, it makes it more explicit that, that John is the beloved disciple. Um, and there isn't any talk of, of Jesus being in Egypt, being a, a priest of Isis, but there's one line where he's, again, arguing with the Judeans, and they say, you know, we know his parents, and he, he studied, he studied this stuff in Egypt. He got this stuff from Egypt. He got this knowledge from Egypt, right? Um, so there's that, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, uh, on the cross, um, it, it, it's explicit that, he, that John is the, is, the, is the beloved disciple. He's named John. He's not in the canonical one. It just says, I think the disciple that Jesus loved is there with him and his mother, Mary Magdalene, and other women. They're the only one who doesn't abandon him. And the most shocking part of all that I really love, like, like Mark, there's no resurrection. It, it, ends, it ends at the crucifixion. Um, the uh, you know i'll be talking a lot more about this in the future i hope to do a whole show on it or, or a series uh i have i have discovered evidence that i can't share on the show although if people really look they can find it too because it's publicly available but the there, there is evidence that 
that the text was not made up by, by Fabry Palaprat, that it's at least medieval. Um, and that uh, scholars knew about it before Fabry Palaprat, and it did seem to circulate in scholarly communities. We still don't have the, the original Greek, if we can ever find that, that original vellum, that, that original parchment, that original text, and then we can know a lot more about it. But um, yeah, uh, that, that's a little intro to the Leviticon for, for people here. Well, uh, I'm sorry, not for people here, for people listening. Uh, for the people <laughs> here, do you, what do you think about the Leviticon? Because when I first heard about it, I, I, I got to say, um, I don't know if this is confirmation bias because I like the AJC so much, but when I first heard about it, I'm like, wow, an alternate secret gospel of John with Jesus is the, the priest of Isis. This is, my, this is going to be mind blowing. And then you read it and it's not that different from gospel of John. You're like, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the other thing too, that if it's a fake, it's like, yeah, it's a lot of effort to, you know, just do like a little edit. Um, but uh, but then it, it really grew on me. Uh, and, uh, and because I do have an interest in, in New Testament studies and a bit of a, a, a formal academic background, not a lot, you know, the, I think I, it grabs me more than, than other people. But uh, anybody, uh, Angie, you, you're a Johannite uh, uh, deacon. Um, by the way, I'm going to say Johannite different every time I say it. Johannite, <laughs> okay. Johannine, Johannite, Joe, John's church, whatever. Uh, take it away, deacon. <laughs> Um, I don't really have any big insight, but I it does make me wonder what does it mean about our relationship to Jesus without his resurrection? Yeah. You know, how how does that how does that impact our own personal gnosis that it's not external of ourselves and that the end is the end? Um, you know, it, it does relate to to this earth just being a, a horrible dumpster fire and then we <laughs> and then we're dead you know i find that that theology very relaxing and comforting um and, and so that there's that there's this finality to it but yet it continues um yeah that was that was interesting and and uh, if you are gnostic and and thinking about your gnosis what does it mean to to not have a resurrection and still have jesus very cool. Uh, uh, Jason? Yeah, I, I was also thinking about that, like the the assumption that the Leviticon is actually about the like the non-miracle Jesus and how that's probably just a confusion with the Gospel of Thomas, um, which is that the one where it's just sayings, I think? Just sayings. Yeah. Um, but which also feels pretty Gnostic. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's like, uh, it's that sense of, um, it. like I myself have made... Uh, uh, I've confused two different like practices because they sound generally similar when people are like, no, those are actually two completely different things. Um, so I, I wonder if that just in terms of that, that assumption, if that's a, if that's a, a thing about the, uh, some, a branding problem with the, of the, Levit the Leviticon. Um, but uh, yeah, I think like just to kind of go where Angie was going as well, is that like to, to edit it to, I think maybe, to edit it slightly so as to maybe bring it slightly further away from from the attempts that were made to legitimize it, if that makes sense, um, makes it, I think, more more exciting and more interesting. But at the same time, because if, the, if that edit is happening, uh, whenever that edit is happening, it's happening with an awareness and a love for this text that probably still had at least a thousand years of momentum behind it before they decided to find this translation or find this this version of it kind of thing so i think there's there is something interesting about that is that it's like the it's a a text in conversation with itself based on a text that was in conversation with itself if that makes sense so uh literarily i'm fascinated by that yeah uh nick yeah i mean i don't have a, a ton of opinions about it but i think this the this concept about not having the resurrection um I guess you could kind of take it in a couple of ways too, right? So it's it's both, it could be there is no resurrection in this world, or it could be, you know, you, it's not that this person is resurrected, but then you have to like take this up in some way um, as like a, you know, and that, that, and that does remind me of something that I would think about like a Masonic or like kind of esoteric Masonic use of this, which is identifying with the light, like the search, the search for more light. Um, and that, you know, that becomes a personal process. Um, so I do think that that's kind of an interesting way to read it where, you know, it ends not because um, necessarily there is no resurrection, but because it has to be, you know, in yourself or in, in a community. Um, so I don't know, that's that's kind of interesting. But yeah, I don't know. I don't have that many opinions about the, the kind of the historical claims. I mean, it makes sense to me. It, yeah, it doesn't read that weird. It's not like 
you open it and you're like, oh, there's aliens or something. Like it's not like anything like that. It's it still seems like a pretty you could you could believe that um it's a medieval text because it's it's mostly just it's I mean I, I I'm not sure if there are are there additions in it or it's more things removed. Um, it's uh it's more that there's less like there, yeah. there's only there's only those three additions so um which are relatively minor though still pretty big you know mm -hmm. like like the the no resurrection is, is probably the biggest where the, the other two are are a little bit more minor um i think when it comes to like biblical uh, scripture no edits are minor <laughs> yes that's right that's right yes yeah good point yeah. um you know i i i'll talk about the text and, and the, the quote unquote no resurrection because and again uh, most modern bibles uh, we'll we'll put a note on this. So uh, Mark originally ends with no resurrection, and yeah. then later on, a hundred years, two hundred years later, they wrote they wrote an ending with a resurrection. Most modern Bibles will will will, will say this is a this is a later edition, and it'll have the original. It's one of the best endings of of any of any book uh, in the West, right? Regardless of religion, which is uh, the women go to the uh, to the tomb. It's empty. And the Gospel of Mark ends with they ran away because they were afraid and told nobody. <laughs> but we're not talking about Mark. We're talking about Leviticon. Um, so, so Mark is thought to be the earliest gospel. Um, just about all scholars uh, agree on that. Like that's about 99.9% .9 of biblical scholars, I, I, I would think, would, would agree. Uh, uh, for a long time, scholars didn't think that the writer of John knew the other gospels that's changed i don't know if it's quite mainstream it should be mainstream because it's dumb because he obviously knows the other gospels uh, i think he knows some version of uh mark matthew and luke um and it's actually very important that he knows and basically the argument was this gospel is so different from the others that he must not have known them my argument is this gospel is so different from the others that he knew them <laughs> because he wants, you know, he has he has an agenda. The writer, he or she, they, the community. Uh, where was I going with this? So that's the original. That's the original ending of of, of Mark. So so we do have that in the Christian tradition. And um, Nick probably knows where, where I'm going to go with this. Although uh, Jason and uh, Deacon Angie might as well. But the um, again the 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 patriarch, the head bishop of the uh, the AJC, uh, the Marionis, is, is very fond of talking about. The theory in a book called The Community of the Belo Beloved Disciple, which is a, a very important text in biblical studies, looking at uh, the, the Johannine corpus and kind of recreating what was going on in, in the early Johannine uh, communities. This Raymond and, Brown, um, right? Mm -hmm. huh? Raymond Brown. That's right. Yeah. So um, it, he talks about that for for the for the early Johannines. What was it? The resurrection, the second coming, I should say, not the resurrection. Well, we can all say the resurrection. The resurrection, but the second coming uh, was the, the coming of the Christ in the community, in the hearts of the community. So I think not having the resurrection uh, in Mark or the Leviticon makes that much more explicit, right? That where does the resurrection happen, right? It's it's in the it's in the hearts of, of the community, and I really like that. Um, and uh, in in some uh, streams of death of God theology and radical theology, which we'll talk on the show at some point, that's very important. Or atheistic Christianity, that's very mm -hmm. important, which is the understanding, right, that there is no supernatural God, um, that God actually does die on the cross. So the resurrection and second coming of Christ has to be in the hearts of the of the. Um, of the, uh, the believers, so yeah, I really, I really like that. And whether it's original or, or it's an edit, it's one of the things that makes me think that it, that it, that it's old, right? Because uh, Mark uh, has that ending as well. Also, as I was saying earlier, uh, what I was getting to, the Leviticon's a lot more fun because you can sit down and you can read it, and then you can read Secret Book of John or Gospel of Mary, which is the res resurrection uh, narratives. Yeah. Um, okay, we are starting to get close to to wrap up time. Um, Somebody asked me about the Jews in the Gospel of John. <laughs> <laughs> Leading question, Your Honor. <laughs> well, did, I was I was gonna almost ask you that when we were talking about you know is this written by a, a Gnostic community or a community that wasn't necessarily connected to like the Hebrew Scriptures? In the mm -hmm. same way that explains some of the the way they talk, not like as Pharisee, the particular sect, but as the Jews, which mm -hmm. definitely is still a uh, problematic <laughs> in this yeah. text. It has been used in lots of bad ways. I, exactly. It, maybe, if you're not familiar with Christianity or with biblical studies, if you sit down and read it, it, it seems like an almost hateful text. And and this is this is something. Oh, go ahead, Jason. Yeah. No, I just want to I, I want to say that because again, coming as the guy who like had never read a full book of the Bible till yesterday, um, 
this was that was something that really struck me. I was like, oh wow, you know, this was this there. It feels almost anti-Semitic, um, or what a lot of anti-Semitism would then go and point back to, you know. Yes, anti-Semitism yeah. did and does continue to do so, yeah. um, and and I think it's a real shame because it has had the nickname the Gospel of Love for uh, uh, many hundreds, maybe thousands of years now. So the thing with quote unquote, the Jews in the gospel of John is uh, once upon a time, uh, there was two kingdoms uh, of the Hebrew people, Israel and Judea, right? And these, this divided kingdom would, would, was always bickering with each other. So if we look at the gospel of John as a record of of a bickering family, of, a, of, of communities that aren't, Jewish, Christian, or Gnostic yet, okay? Then when we understand that the proper translation is not Jew, but Judean, which uh, Nick, if, if you know, I, I don't know uh, Koine Greek, but I have enough to know that that is a perfectly legitimate, it's the same word. You can translate it as Judean, and it is, it is uh, the same word. If you, if you read carefully the, the Gospel of John, you will notice, uh, I think even before, quote unquote, he says the Jews, um, Philip comes along and Jesus says, here comes a proper Israelite right? Uh, Jesus and Nicodemus, he calls uh, Nicodemus a great Israelite. Uh, he talks about the Pharisees. Uh, they talk about some, some other groups. So what's actually going on is that is, is a group called that, that the, the creator, that the writer of the gospel of John is calling the Judeans. And he's playing on the symbolism of the two warring, uh, of the two kingdoms that were always bickering. Right. Yeah. So the the Hebrew people that he likes, he calls Israelites and the ones that he doesn't like, he calls Judeans. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of, of scholars and, uh, and even some new biblical translations are no longer translating it as the Jews or translating mm -hmm. it as the Judeans. Uh, yeah. I know the Jesus Seminar does that. And I know some progressive biblical translations do it. And this is, uh, I think, um, I, I mean, I guess at the end of the day, it's a theory, but I, I think it is almost, you know, I'm 100% uh, convinced that this is correct. And when you read it that way, that this is, uh, this is one family of religions, of groups, groups all uh, uh, intimate with each other who are bickering and arguing, and you have the wrong interpretation, right? Or you are, you are the part of the group that, that is bad. Uh, instead of having this external demarcated enemy, like, you know, we're the Israelites, you're the Judeans. It, it really, I think, takes out a lot of that anti-Semitism when read through modern eyes and really gets across the idea of, of bickering groups. Also, synagogue is, um, is a Greek word. It just, it just means meeting place. And it was not only used by Judeans and Christians and Gnostics at the time, uh, but was also uh, used by pagans. It just means meeting place. House of meeting, something like that. So I was just looking in, in uh, John three twenty five, where it does do that, where it says there was then a discussion of the disciples of John with a Jew about purification. But yeah, the a Jew is uh, Eudios, so not not so much. Yeah, and so but that does feel like in the translation, it, it becomes John's disciples versus a Jew. But then yeah. if it's Eudios, it's very it, it, it's definitely a different inflection. Exactly, exactly. So, hey, Jason, thanks so much for asking me about that, because it is a bugaboo <laughs> of mine. Um, and, and actually, I have informally, you know, this said to people who are in the AJC, but I think I might formally uh, put this across at, at our next AGM, that if, if, if there's ever a, a, the a second edition, the, the AJC holds the copyright on the translation of the Leviticon, mm -hmm. that we should, if there's ever going to be a second version, that, that you should be changed to Judean. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe maybe have a little introduction explaining why that is, and perhaps change all the references to Jews in our liturgical uh, um, uh, readings, as they're still in there, to to Judean. Uh, mm -hmm. Judean. So, um, yes, excellent question. Uh, okay, <laughs> we better, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> Sorry. Unfortunately, oh wait, actually, I, I do have one one thing for, for Nick that, that that he might like. So, you. After after the, the washing of the feet, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Jesus gives what he says is a new commandment, and it could be interpreted as the only commandment, which is love one another as I've loved you. Mm -hmm. So April DeConnick um, says that some of the early Joannites basically interpreted this in a Gnostic way to say that we don't need any rules or laws. We mm -hmm. just need love. So maybe maybe a way to sum this up could possibly be Love is the law, love under will. Oh, yeah. Love and do as thou wilt. 
Isn't yeah. it? Which, which uh, Augustine said, not, yeah. not Crowley. Yeah. 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 Hmm. yeah. No, I, I mean, Augustine says it, says it first, right? And perhaps he's drawing on older material, but it, it does seem that that, that was, that, that, that could be the morality when we're talking mm -hmm. about morality and ethics of, of the early uh, community of John, which is as long as we love, we can, uh, if we're doing it through love, we can do what we will. <laughs> um, hmm. But and, that I, I think, by love. Oh, there's God, only yeah. one law. Um, just to, to jump in there too, like this kind of goes back to something I was saying there before, like um, John often, uh, uh, John in the show, not Book of John, um, often likes to describe me as as like not with the church, not like not big on the Jesus guy. It's again, it's, I think the 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 practically revolutionary language of like love, love each other, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, that kind of like that, that stuff is like the hardest stuff to live by, you know? Um, and, and I have no problem with thinking that that's a powerful statement worth following. Um, uh, it's, and it's that kind of, that kind of intense call to do something so difficult. Um, you know, again, this is maybe an interesting time to call out, uh, the, the Schwepp, the Secret History of Western Esotism podcast, because one of the things that's great about that show is how it puts so much of what's happening, um, uh, uh, you know, like as these gospels are getting written, and and as and before these gospels are written, in the in the context of so many other um, philosophies and religions and mysticisms that were before that, and uh, like I look, say for example, at at a lot of what Stoicism was trying to get people to do, and it's like simple advice, hard as hell to live by, <laughs> you know. Um, and I think there's again maybe something similar here, like if there is, I mean, again, I'm. I have no scholarly background here, but if there is a histor historicity of Jesus, it feels like if these really powerful statements that somehow sneak their way into all the representations of him um, that are to me the most fascinating. And I think that's something I, yeah, I just wanted to, to, to call that out before we get to the end here. Uh, yeah, I mean, just to go back to the, something John said really early about the non-dualism or qualified non-dualism, I'm thinking here of uh, different communities. We mentioned the Cathars, but then, something like the Brethren of the Free Spirit. I don't know if folks have read, it's another medieval heresy that were accused of being antinomian and basically basically following that, you know, once you're one with Christ, you could do anything because you're, once you're, you know, you, you could become internally one on this level that Orthodox Christianity didn't agree with. And then you really could, it, they didn't have kind of a, uh, I mean, they were very moral, I think, is the other thing. Usually these traditions that get accused of being antinomian aren't quite as like, free-spirited as people say but that was part of the theology of this kind mm -hmm. of medieval quietism and so you see passages like that used i think yeah yeah exactly um and, and there are some pot shots at the law uh, i believe in the gospel of john <laughs> too right so it could also read you know which leads to the antinomian reading which of course leads to the theory that the anti that they that the early uh, uh joanites were were antinomian okay wrapping up uh, i think uh angie dropped out she might have been having technical problems or had to go but that's okay because the show's over hey everybody thanks so much for coming uh you can find nick at the light uh read his stuff there um jason we can find jason at sagetheater.com and at jasonmemel.com uh <laughs> you can find me at uh go to mylandmeditation.substack.com i do free meditation secular meditation mindfulness uh it's not particularly gnostic but it's good for gnostics too it's good for everybody come on out 11 a.m. Uh, we do it online. That's Eastern Standard Time. It's free. Uh, we got a good crowd. Uh, you know, the world's not going to get better anytime soon. You're going to need some skills to deal with it. Mindfulness is a good one. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, oh, man, there's still, you know, I was worried about the show because I'm like, oh, well, we, well, we have enough to talk about. But of course, we're, we're past the hour mark now. Uh, and uh, Jason, when you were talking about learning the context uh, you know, uh, that these, these, um, text come out of I forgot there was one thing I wanted to talk to you about which maybe we can do a whole show on but there's a very convincing book um, talking about the influence of the Bakai on the Gospel of John and, oh, yeah. On, yeah. and yeah. you know there's, there's a lot of garbage out there about you know pagan influence on Christianity and Christianity stealing stuff from pagans and that's that's not what this book is saying right it, mm -hmm. it just it's saying that hey like 
they're familiar with, with, with the Bakai, they're, they're familiar with the followers of Dionysus and teaching about him. So they're, they're using that as, as an influence, they're actually contrasting Jesus with Dionysus and saying that, you know, he, Jesus is the true God. Um, mm -hmm. But using some of the structure of the Bakai and using some of the, the teachings and beliefs uh, about Dionysus. So we'll, uh, uh, that's a whole show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so look forward to that, everybody. And thanks so much for joining us. Good night. Good night. Good night. Oh, wait, wait, Angie's back. Angie, uh, we were just saying goodbye. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Have a good night. good night. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>